morning, everybody. My name is Wanda Stutzman. I'm a Tarrant County Master Gardener, and today we're going to talk about gardening to attract birds, butterflies, and beneficials to our wildscapes. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this presentation was originally created by um, Marilyn Sally, who was a Tarrant County Master Gardener, and I have made some modifications to it, so I don't want to give her credit because some of the pictures are hers as well. Today's presentation is brought to you by TRWD, it's Tarrant Regional Water District. They are the um, association or entity that controls our water supply. A lot of our water in the Tarrant um, County region comes from the Richland Chambers uh, Lake and the Cedar Creek Lake. They have to pump it all the way up here to Fort Worth and a few years ago they decided that they wanted to partner with Tarrant County Master Gardeners to educate the community on um, water conservation. Looking ahead, as the population is going to grow, they thought that instead of putting larger pipelines or more pipelines in, maybe if we talk to people about um, managing their water consumption and uh, using special tools that are available to them for sprinkler systems and such that they could um, uh, reduce the water consumption and therefore we don't have to pump as much water from those um, aquifers. So SafeTarrantWater.com is their website. Um, it is a great resource for you as a homeowner. You can um, sign up for a free sprinkler check um, by a licensed sprinkler uh, inspection person and they'll come out and they'll make sure that you not um, having leaks or if you're watering an appropriate amount of time for your yard or over watering and that type of thing. Um, then they also offer free weekly watering advice, um, have calendar events and classes like this one um, for you to sign up for, and then lots of water saving tips and videos. And uh, they're finding that this information has really been very helpful to the communities. But today we're going to talk about inviting garden wildlife to our um, gardens, our home gardens. We can call them wildscapes and sometimes this time of year it's a summer. We have a lot of weeds in our gardens and so it looks pretty wild. Um, but uh, anyhow, so what is a wildscape? Um, it provides food, water, shelter for wildlife. And those are the three main elements that are needed for birds, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other creatures. These can be small and simple um, sources for the birds and hummingbirds, uh, such as bird seed, hummingbird feeders, dish of water or a bird bath, a shrub to hide in or to nest in. But they can also be expensive. You can do your whole landscape and native plants for specific species. But one thing that was really important in creating a wildscape and trying to attract, attract wildlife to your uh, property is that you do not use chemicals. And if you do use them, you use them very sparingly and you read the labels on the um, chemical bottles. Why have a wildscape? Well, we want to bring uh, nature closer to us. Um, in the past years, we've all sort of been locked up in our houses due to the pandemic and um, we wanted to be able to see the wildlife. Um, we started feeding birds more readily in our yards during the winter. Um, it was one of the only sources of enjoyment we had for nature for a few months. But um, just bringing those uh, animals into your yard and you know that you have a healthy, happy uh, wildscape. So there's um, birds, butterflies, beneficial insects, which there are plenty of those, um, small animals and um, like toads and frogs and lizards and then um, enjoying the native plants that they are also enjoying. So then you have a, a healthier yard for you and for them. How to make a wildscape? Well, um, what is the best way to uh, attract it? Um, uh, how much space do you need? And provide food, water, shelter, and safety to your, um, for the animals. So let's talk about that. Food, a native plants or a dish of food, water, a puddle, a bird bath, or a pond, shelter, shrubs, rocks, trees, brush, 
Um, uh, yes, brush is really important. A lot of birds nest and are ground feeders and they like to be in the brush. Uh, safety, a really safe place to raise their young. Preparing your soil for nectar plants. Uh, creating a successful gardener, garden starts with preparing a soil that plants will thrive in. Soil is very important. Identify your soil type, get your soil tested through our program, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Uh, you can Google soil testing Texas A&M and it will come up with a website and they have the forms and they tell you how to uh, collect the soil. And getting your soil test is really important because some of us have um, high levels of phosphate, some of us have high levels of magnesium, some of us have absolutely no nitrogen in our soil. Uh, even though the soil seems to be healthy and happy, um, the nitrogen is, is missing. So we add that. Um, so then we add in the needed compost and amendments to create the ha healthy soil. And um, we do that here on my property with um, adding uh, compost um, and then uh, feeding it with um, a organic fertilizer a few times a year. And then when, if you have clay soil, you're gonna want to um, add expanded shell for more drainage. That is very critical um, as you till your gray, uh, clay soil adding that expanded shell, adding compost, organic matter, creating a better, healthier soil. If you have sandy soil, you're gonna to wanna to add um, a heavier compost um, to bulk up that soil um, and to retain water. Because if you do not amend the sandy soil, the water that you do apply goes straight through it. Rocky soil may need a bulldozer. Um, honestly, you may only be able to plant uh, sedums and and cacti and such in, in really rocky soil, or you can consider doing raised beds. Um, and, and that helps a lot um, if you have soil that's just unmanageable. Um, install drip irrigation system that you can um, uh, then control the volume of the water that is provided to the plants. And that is um, something we teach people how to design. Um, and then all good soil needs earthworms, and that's why I added that little image at the bottom. Uh, earthworms are viable to maintaining healthy soil. What do we mean, we mean when we say no chemicals? Well, there's three main pesticides. There's uh, insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. In our home garden, they will do more damage than good. So we look for alternative ways to treat um, infestations of uh, bacteria, infestations of um, animals and um, any diseases that apply. So definitely research those chemicals before you apply them. More is not better. Um, that is a motto of ours, uh, especially even with fertilizer, more is not better. So consider um, applying as directed and read those instructions, but it's preferred that you do not use any of these harsh chemicals in your garden. And there are uh, alternatives uh, available. Pesticides are a broad spectrum and uh, non-selective, so they will kill beneficial insects as well as non-beneficial. And so you have to remember that, even though you may want to get around uh, or get away from snails, um, or slugs, you may also be hurting uh, roly polies or ladybugs. The larvae of our beneficial insects will die if they consume plants treated with pesticides. And that's very true with monarch butterflies um, and uh, many of the other uh, species that come to our gardens. Bees will die from collected pollen on treated plants. So even though we don't see it, uh, we don't see the damage being done when they collect the pollen, um, they uh, will take it back to their hives and then that will eventually destroy their hive. Stored water runoff also carries all of these pesticides, herbicides and such into our lakes, causing more damage to our ecosystems. So you have to really remember that. 
um, and uh, be cautious of how much of these products you're putting on your, your yard and flowers. What to use instead? Um, there are things like sticky traps, uh, insecticidal soaps, dormant oils used in small areas at a time, um, and then 20% vinegar as a weed killer. Uh, that's, these are all available at your big box stores or your small um, uh, commercial nurseries or, or retail nurseries, may I say. And, um, and then select some plants that will help deter unwanted pests like marigolds and citronella geranium and things like that. And we all tend to want to plant those deter mosquitoes for sure. Wildscape features for attracting butterflies. Um, butterflies are wonderful assets to our garden, and they're just such a treat to watch. What do you need to put in place to attract butterflies? Well, you need nectar food, um, host plants for caterpillars, water, shelter, and a place to rest in the sun. So you really you need all five of these elements, um, not just one that's going to do it. So just because you've got food, um, if you don't have the shelter and the host plants for the caterpillars, the butterflies will search those places out other, in other people's gardens. Food for butterflies is the nectar from the flowers. So a lot of our trumpet looking uh, flowers and such have a lot of nectar down inside of them. Typically, the flowers are colors like hot red, pink, orange, purple. Um, they're shape and tubular trumpet shape. And um, if you right off the bat, you can think of a ton of different um, plants like that. There's daylilies, there's trumpet vine, there's honeysuckle, um, a lot of different plants, um, standing cypress, uh, salvias. Uh, they all have those shapes and they all have um, nectar. Uh, the structure flat or um, they present their center. So the tube opens up so that the, the um, bee or butterfly can get into um, the plant to get the nectar. Um, you can do other things too. If you don't have all these plants, maybe you just have a patio garden um, and you can add a, a saucer with nectar or rotting fruit. Some specific plants butterflies love um, are, there are a lot, and so we're just going to go through a few, and you may want to take a screenshot of this because you're not going to remember them all, but these are all beautiful butterflies that we can have in our gardens. Nectar plants for butterflies, you have perennials, and they're asters, any kind of variety, goldenrod, um, Goldenrod and ragweed look a, a lot alike, and on the sides of the road, you will think that's goldenrod, but it's really ragweed. Goldenrod is different. Uh, it looks the same, but it's a different uh, plant and does not produce the allergies. Um, garden flocks. There's a lot of varieties of garden flocks. There's summer flock, flocks called uh, David. Um, there's lots of different flocks. Um, butterfly weed. This one, a lot of people want to grow in our gardens um, because it does attract butterflies, a lot of them. Um, specifically, um, a lot of the butterfly weed is grown naturally out on prairies. When you start bringing butterfly weed into your garden, they don't necessarily like great cultivated soil and frequent waterings. So you have to be really careful with butterfly weed um, because you can kill it quickly. Um, blanket flower, blazing star liatris, um, coreopsis of any variety, cone flowers of pretty much any color. You didn't have to just be purple. Stone crop sedum, and this is something that grows really well here. A lot of people forget about it, but it's um, a really nice plant. Black Eyed Susans, we love those. They fill in spaces and bloom all summer. Bee Balm, Monarda, purple, red, uh, bright colors are really cool. Greg's Mist Flower is one of the most popular plants we put in our gardens. 
Uh, it spreads like crazy, but it is a wonderful plant for attracting butterflies. Abelias, they're just covered in trumpet flowers when they bloom. There's lots of varieties. Garlic chives, which is a unique plant to the rest of those. Um, and that also, when it blooms, uh, attracts them. We have annuals that attract them. Lantana, zinnias, uh, marigold, and cosmos. Um, other, other plants as well, but uh, this is just a nice variety. So I hope you took a screenshot of that. Other types of food for butterflies. Um, hummingbird nectar, whipped from a jar, rotting fruit in a tray, um, which is kind of, sounds disgusting, uh, but an ants might get in it, but you might refresh it often and um, put it in a place the ants might not be able to get to it, especially if you were to like hang it. And then you have sweet stuff painted on uh, tree trunks or in a saucer. Um, just a pink, uh, a sweet gooey product of some sort that um, you could put out there and just paint on a tree trunk. Of course, that will attract ants, but if it's on a tree, you might not mind at all. The water for butterflies equals um, a shallow moisture where they can um, drink safely. Uh, they don't like deep ponds. They don't like swimming pools. They just like very shallow um, sources of water like mud puddles. Uh, they drink uh, in the dissolved minerals and nutrients from those. Um, rocks and bird baths uh, provide a great landing spot uh, so that the uh, butterfly doesn't have to actually get in uh, the water totally. Um, and then saucers that are very shallow like uh, the saucer that goes under a clay pot or something that sometimes I just set those over to the side and I put water in those um, on the ground for any passerbys, anybody who might want to pass by. Um, shelter for butterflies equals rest and protection. So in summer, butterflies can find many places for shelter, but in the winter, butterflies need more protected shelter. Um, so like monarchs, sulfas, and snouts, they migrate, but there are a lot of others that do not migrate and they want um, some protection. So in the winter, they will hibernate in tree bark, wood piles, tall grasses, and spent perennials, um, which is really kind of neat because we don't trim back a lot of our perennials until February. Um, we, and we don't trim back a lot of our tall grasses until then. So over the winter, they can um, uh, rest in there and take shelter. Host plants for butterfly caterpillars. Again, this is another one you might want to take a screenshot of because it would be difficult to remember. But monarchs only like milkweed. Um, black swallowtails um, like carrots, rue, parsley, dill, and fennel. So those are more of a... a um, vegetable garden crop or herb crops. Tiger swallowtails, um, they do wild cherry, birch, ash, popular, poplar, um, apple trees, tulip trees, uh, sycamore. So again, they're more in the trees. Pipe vine swallowtails just do Dutchman's pipe. Um, so again, and that's not an easy plant to grow or come across. And a lot of people um, search for it and uh, look for cuttings and such for Dutchman's pipe. Great spangled filter fertility. Um, they like violets. Um, so again, you have your um, morning cloak and the willow and the elm. So again, take a, a screenshot of this um, and save it so that you um, will have it for reference when you're planting your garden. Caterpillar to butterfly monarch. So here we have um, a caterpillar uh, on milkweed and there's a chrysalis right above it. And then we have the butterfly on the uh, another plant, maybe um, a pinta or something getting some nectar. 
anyhow, so we want to talk about the stages of this. Um, butterflies lay their eggs, or monarch butterflies specifically lay their eggs there so that when the larvae are hatch, uh, they have the source of food ready and available to them. So they are looking for um, mature um, milkweed for their eggs and their caterpillars to munch on. So you also have to remember um, that they will eat their ear plants. That's what you planted the plant there for, was to attract the monarch butterfly. And um, so you could enjoy the, seeing the butterfly in your garden. And then um, when the larva hatch, they eat and then they uh, spin their chrysalis um, on the same plant and then they will hatch into beautiful butterflies. And believe me, uh, the plant will survive, it will come back, it will grow more leaves and it'll be ready for next year. So larva food, um, so a, a fertility um, only eat passion vine. So uh, this is the um, butterfly here. Um, and then here are the caterpillars. And so again, just like the monarch on uh, milkweed, we have um, this one will only like to eat passion vine. So if you do all the things that we just talked about, then you could go to the monarchwatch.org uh, website and you could look at the requirements and application and, and get a certified uh, monarch waste station habitat in your garden. I know a number of people who have them and um, they just enjoy the butterflies and feeding the, the uh, caterpillars. Wildscapes. Uh, features for attracting birds. So we've talked about butterflies and we're talking now about birds. And we all love birds. The requirements, again, some of the same things, food, water, shelter, a place to rest, and a good place to raise their young. So almost the exact same um, requirements as a butterfly, but they're gonna be different elements. Um, bird feeders, definitely have bird feeders. Uh, there are many styles and different styles attract different birds because they hold different seed. And um, so you can do your research there. There's a lot of um, a lot of places to obtain those. But birds also like um, uh, seeds, seeds from our plants. Um, they're ground feeders uh, type birds and they feed only on the ground. So they look for casting nuts, pellets, mealworms, uh, other things that are also attracted to our garden um, and uh, they feed on those. So we want to offer uh, food and shelter with trees and shrubs. And we, some of us think about this a lot, um, that the berries on most of our winter trees um, are really the food for our birds. Um, there's Nandina. Nandina, though, on the domestic um, Nandina, they will eat those uh, berries and then they will drop them in other places and it can be kind of invasive. But we have our Yopons and our Possmall Hollies. And this is a Possmall Holly and it's beautiful addition to a landscape. I have one and I just love it. And the birds will come and eat the berries um, throughout the winter. Water sources for birds. There's lots of water sources and I know this time of year if you run your sprinklers you're going to see birds flocking to the grass. Um, they're getting little droplets of water uh, from where the sprinklers ran but they're also looking to see if any worms came up or any other bugs were dis um, uh, displaced with um, the watering of the grass. But we have little um, uh, pitchers of water, saucers of water. We have bird baths, which um, dry out really quickly this time of year, but um, we keep them filled and the birds love it. And then swimming pools are an excellent source of um, uh, water for birds. And my swimming pool is a lot like this one and it has a 
raised waterfall and the birds will light on the edge and drink um, some of that water, especially when the waterfall is turned off, they will um, light on this edge and drink from the spa area. So lots of sources of water for birds. Shelter for birds can be man-made. It can be holes in the side of a tree where a limb has rotted off. Um, it can be um, somewhere in the ground under a shrub. Um, a lot of my cardinals like to nest in shrubs. I'm not sure why they like to do that because we have cats and that just makes it really difficult um, to raise their young um, after the eggs hatch and such. But um, so all birds are not really smart, but they do try to find really nice places in your garden. And um, so, um, yeah, so whatever type of bird you're looking for, you may find that you have what they need in your garden already. So not all birds eat seeds and berries. All these big birds, pileated woodpecker, the turkey vulture, this is a hawk, um, and uh, road runners, they will eat any kind of bugs, grasshoppers, um, small rodents, and that type of thing, which we all know. So we want to be able to attract those to our garden as well. Wildscapes may attract other wildlife, um, and that's very normal. Uh, it happens uh, to all of us who garden. We um, tend to put plants or vegetables or such in our gardens that will attract other wildlife. We have dragonflies. Dragonflies are so cool to watch and they love to be above ponds or pools, anywhere that they can have a, a good backdrop um, so they can see the bugs flying around. And pools tend to do that. They tend to be a, a solid color source so they can see the, the flies or so more clearly over the pool. Um, the other neat thing, if you do have a pool and you have dragonflies, if you are in the pool and you hold your fingers up to your side like this um, and you're real still, the dragonflies will light on your fingers and you can um, get a really close up view of them. It's really a neat little trick and we uh, tend to do it a lot at our um, swimming pool uh, sort of show off to the kids. Um, pretty moths. Uh, we get a lot of different kinds of moths out here. There's the hawk or hummingbird moth, the isle moth. Um, anyhow, so you can be attracting moths to your um, garden and not even know it because you're trying to attract birds and butterflies. Beneficial insects. We have lacewing eggs right over here, and this is an adult lacewing. They are very beneficial. Praying um, mantis, um, I just saw a new baby the other day. It's interesting because you look around, when you see one, you're looking around because you know that they hatch like a hundred of them. Uh, and so you're, you, you only a few survive, or they disperse very, very quickly. So I saw one that was only about a, a uh, half an inch long and so I thought for sure if I kept looking I would find plenty more and I didn't so I thought that was interesting and then you have the yellow garden spider um, over here and those are super beneficial and super fun to watch I love them um, but if you garden a lot you kind of know where they're going to be in your garden because if you get tangled up in their web um, uh, it can be kind of messy. So I, I know where mine are and I try to stay away from them. Frogs, toads, geckos, and lizards. Uh, we have lots of those. Um, we provide a lot of different um, environments for them. Moist environments are shade gardens and then um, dry environments with uh, lots of uh, plants and such where they will feed off of any of the little bugs, aphids and such that come across there. They like flies, mosquitoes. Um, they crawl on your screens of your house. A lot of people are really scared of them, but um, uh, they're really fun to have in your garden. And we have a lot of anoles 
um, in our garden and they just race across the, the um, stone walls and they're so much fun to watch. Um, one of the funny things happened to me just the other day, I was moving a bromeliad and bromeliads have a lot of um, moisture in them and this one was loose in its pot and I sort of um, tilted it up and pulled the plant out and this big um, toad came out of it and he just sort of looked at me and he's like, oh, what are we doing? And I said, well, I guess we're not moving you. And so I just sort of put it all back together and put it back down on the ground and um, left him to be on his own. And so he was probably happy with that. Um, but anyhow, you, you just never know where those are, dudes are hanging out. So then we have small animals and we have all of these at my house. Um, raccoon, I don't know, we've seen very many of those, but we have possums and squirrels and lots of rabbits and the rabbits lay there. Clutch, I assume that's what it's called, um, everywhere in my iris, um, on the edge of the property. But when you have these animals, you're attracting bigger animals. And um, I love to watch these, but we live on a busy road and it's, it's not fun to see where a car and the bird and the small animal collided at night but um anyhow uh, they don't really tend to carry the diseases that people are scared that they do um raccoons can carry rabies uh, uh, but um, just don't interact with them and leave them be and then we have our larger animals we have wild turkeys out here. Um, we have lots of coyotes. And the other day I ran a bobcat off of my back patio. I probably should have let it be, but I was a little startled to see it. And um, and I was just ran up to it and I said, what are you doing here? And he took off and jumped over the fence. Um, he was a good looking guy or girl and um, Anyhow, you know, you just get a little startled when you walk out your back door and you see um, a, a wild animal like that just sort of walking around. And I probably, as again, do not approach them like I did. But um, anyhow, so I, we only see them every now and then. And we see more activity now that our neighbors have chickens. Um, prior to the chickens, we had lived here eight years. And yeah, we could hear the coyotes off in the distance. Um, maybe every now and then we could see a sighting of a bobcat, but it just seems like now that the chickens are around, there's an awful lot more activity. And luckily for me, uh, the deer are only a few miles away, but they have not been to um, my garden, and that's a blessing because they love half of what I have planted in my garden. So you can become, um, have a certified wildscape. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation has a backyard wildlife habitat um, certification. You can go to this website here and fill out the online form and mail it in or possibly submit it electronically and pay a $15 fee. Um, so take a screenshot here so you can remember this. But that would be a neat little feature to add to your fence so your neighbors all know you're a certified wildscape. And then the Texas Parks and Wildlife Backyard Wildlife Habitat is a little different. It's a longer form, it has more requirements, and um, it's also uh, a wildscape fee for $15 or a backyard habitat fee for $30. It's a little different than requirements. So again, take a screenshot here and you might um, want to refer back to this and check out what those requirements are. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation today uh, brought to you by Texas um, Master Gardeners, Tarrant County specifically, and TRWD. And um, you can always reach out to us um, and look us up under uh, TCMGA um, and just do a search on that and you will find us. Um, so it's Tarrant County Master Gardener Association. So again, thank you for your time and uh, appreciate the um, opportunity to share with you um, how to create a wildscape.